We're now going to take a look at the data that we collected for this double pipe heat exchanger and how to calculate heat transfer coefficients. We need to know a few properties of the fluid flowing through our heat exchanger. Our hot fluid, which is just hot water, has a density at about 65 degrees C of 980.2 kilograms per cubic meter and at 8 degrees C the cold fluid density is about a thousand kilograms per cubic meter. The length of our tube is three feet which calculates to be 0.9144 meters. Inside diameter of or the outside diameter of our tube is a half an inch calculates to be 0.0127 meters. Inside diameter is 0.4 inches and we calculate that in meters and our shell inside diameter is one inch which is 0.0254 meters. We can calculate the outside surface area of our tube using the outside diameter of the tube and multiplying it by the outside diameter times pi times the length and gives us the result there. Inside diameter is also calculated in a similar fashion using the inside diameter uh, and the length as well. And then we can calculate the log mean area using the formula given before. The cross-sectional area of our tube is based on the inside diameter of the tube which will be pi d squared over 4. The cross-sectional area of the uh, shell side will be based on the difference between its cross-sectional area and the tube cross-sectional area. The effective diameter of the tube is just equal to the diameter of the tube, whereas for the effective diameter of the shell is the difference between the inside diameter of the shell minus the outside diameter of the tube. Our tube material is copper, so we'll look up its thermal conductivity being 388 watts per meter Kelvin. And the term regarding the resistance to heat transfer for the material using the formula given before gives us this value. In our experiment, we varied the cold water flow from 1 to 5 gallons per minute and also varied the hot water flow between 0.5 and 1.5 gallons per minute. We collected data for the inlet of the tube was 65 degrees C. The outlet of the tube is given in this column here. The inlet temperature of the shell side is at 8 degrees C and the outlet temperature is given to us as in this column here. So based on this, we can then calculate the mass flow rate of our hot stream, which will be equal to the volumetric flow rate uh, divided by the, or multiplied by the density. And the mass flow rate of the cold stream can be calculated as well. We can calculate the tube side heat transfer using the mass flow rate times the heat capacity, which is 4,200 joules per kilogram. Uh, degree Celsius and then using the difference in temperatures of the inlet and outlet we can calculate the heat transfer by the tube fluid. We can also calculate the heat transfer to the shell fluid using a similar formula as well. And note that the, the two are different somewhat and we'll have to address this later. But uh, we'll continue on with our calculations. Our difference at the left-hand side of our heat exchanger between the shell and tube fluid is given to us by uh, this formula here. And at the uh, right-hand side of our heat exchanger, delta T2 is given to us by this formula. And you might want to note that this is a counter current heat exchanger. Our delta T log mean driving force is given by the formula using delta T1 and delta T2. And knowing the surface area for heat transfer and the heat transfer rate and the delta T log mean, we can calculate a heat transfer coefficient. And this is going to be based on the outside surface area of the tube. And in this first column, 
we calculated it using the heat transfer from the shell fluid and for the first case we get 242 watts per meter squared Kelvin whereas if we based it on the heat transfer rate of the tube fluid it is slightly different at 237 so we're within about 2% to 3% error based on the tube or the shell fluid and this could be because we use a constant heat capacity uh, for the fluids that's being the same at 8 degrees Celsius and also at 65 we can calculate the velocity in the tube based on the tube cross-sectional area and the density of the fluid and the velocity in the shell can be calculated as well and our average temperature of our tube fluid is equal to the inlet plus the outlet divided by 2 and the outlet of the shell fluid is calculated in a similar fashion we can then calculate film heat transfer coefficients using the formula given where we use the velocity of the uh, shell fluid divided by the effective diameter raised to the respective powers plus also the empirical formula that relates the temperature uh, and the other parameters of that shell fluid and we get a film heat transfer coefficient of 919 and we get a heat transfer coefficient for the film in the tube side using a similar exp uh, expression so now we're able to calculate the inverse of the heat transfer coefficient 1 over mu zero by taking the reciprocal of the film heat transfer coefficients of the inside and outside and also the term that was calculated based on the thermal conductivity of the metal and we calculate the inverse of the heat transfer coefficient and then finally by inverting it determine what our model heat transfer coefficient is expected to be let's take a look at comparing the model values given in this column versus the experimental values and I'll use the one calculated based on the heat transfer rate from the shell fluid and take a look at the plot here and so on the x-axis I have our measured heat transfer coefficient and on the y-axis I have the model heat transfer coefficient notice that we have very good agreement between model and measured at the upper ranges of the heat transfer coefficient but we do see some significant discrepancy down here at the lower end of the measured heat transfer coefficient a reason why could be because the model that we used is most likely based on turbulent flow conditions and if we look at our velocities of our tube side we find that I'm sorry of our shell side we find that we got some low values down in this region here and so perhaps we're not under turbulent conditions but as soon as we get to a half a meter per second and higher that's where we get our good agreement so that might be an explanation as to why the model and the experimental have some disagreement particularly in this low region but we can be quite confident that the model is very accurate at this region out here so that is a explanation of how to calculate heat transfer coefficients based on the model flow rates and the temperature differences given to us